This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Sign up today and get free access to my new Logistics of D-Day series on watchnebula.com. So last month I got to fulfill a dream of mine. Somehow this nerdy boy from the west of Ireland got invited to fly with the United States Air Force Air Demonstration Squadron known as the Thunderbirds. Now you know I'm going to explain the science and history behind high G maneuvers, but Getting this first-hand experience with high G really gave me a better understanding of not only how it works, but how it feels. Check this out. Thunderbirds, stand by. Smoke. Smoke on ready now. Smoke off ready now. Thunderbirds, release brakes ready now. Burners now. Alright, that's max AB. There's 100 miles an hour. Airborne, 14, coming, 1, definitely do, do that right. Yep, definitely didn't do that right. During that vertical climb, I reached about 4.6 Gs. There is literally no scenario in human evolution that would stimulate the forces your body feels when a fighter jet decides it's time to change direction. It felt like my brain was being rewired as it happened. Like my brain was trying to go into the avatar state and ask my ancestors for advice on how to deal with this shit but not a single one of them even knew what an F-16 was. The closest any of them got to this level of G's was when my grandpappy stood up too fast in 1932 while digging potatoes and got a little lightheaded. Ironically, that is actually your body's primary response to G-forces. When you stand up, gravity will tend to cause blood to pool in your lower extremities. Your body is usually able to deal with this pretty quickly. Your nervous system will detect a drop in blood pressure and cause your heart rate to increase and it will constrict your blood vessels in your legs to raise blood pressure and get that blood back to where it needs to be. This is how your body has evolved to deal with normal day-to-day -day operations but this, this is not a scenario any animal in the past 4.5 billion years of evolution on earth has experienced. This is an experience only the genius and stupidity of man could facilitate. When those G's hit, every cell in my body suddenly weighed 4.5 times more. This wasn't like four and a half people my weight lying on top of me, as the training told me. I have played rugby for most of my life, believe me, it's not the same. When even your blood cells weigh more, things get ugly. So how exactly do G-forces develop in an aircraft? It seems intuitive enough, but the exact mechanism is a bit more complicated than you would expect. First, we need to set up our coordinate system, because not all Gs are born equally. We are going to use my body as a reference frame here, meaning the coordinate system rotates with me. First, we have the most obvious, the Z-axis, which points directly down through your body in the same direction gravity normally would. Downwards is positive G, upwards is negative G. This is the one we need to worry about most when thinking about the effect on the body. Then we have the X axis, which goes laterally through your body. In this case, accelerating the plane will create a positive G in the X axis and decelerating the plane will cause a negative G. Finally, we have the Y axis, which extends from the left to the right of the wing. This readout on the heads up display is for the Z axis. Airspeed is here and in miles per hour. So how can we increase G's? Straight acceleration is the most obvious. We have all experienced how the acceleration of a car will push us back into the seats. That's inertia at play. This is an example of Newton's first law. An object will remain at rest or in motion with a constant velocity unless acted on by an external force. 
the force you feel that pushes you into your seat is actually the seat pushing into you and your body wanting to remain at rest pushes back. So, while I was sitting on the runway, my velocity was zero. My body wanted to remain with a zero velocity, but the force of the plane began pushing into my back to change it, creating a positive G in the GX axis. But that doesn't show up on the G readout. As we said, it's reading the Gs in the Z axis. Now, look at the readout as my pilot, Thunderbird 7, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Gorney, call sign Miami, pulls on the stick and shifts our velocity upwards. It spikes to a maximum of 4.6 Gs in about 3 seconds. So what happened here? If you look at the airspeed readout, it barely changed. If our airspeed barely changed, why were we feeling such high acceleration? Well, because velocity has a directional component. My body had a velocity pointing directly down the runway, and again, thanks to Newton's first law, it wants to remain moving in that direction. But when Miami pulled on the stick, the plane began to rotate and my body began to push into the seat in the direction it was originally pointing, creating a positive g-force in the z-axis, as displayed on the heads-up display. Okay, that's all very cool, but I'm not that interesting. My immediate thought after this flight, besides feeling a little ill, was how humans who had no prior experience of flight or high g's learned to cope with these forces as planes became more advanced and how exactly planes themselves were designed to cope with the immense forces that they were dealing with. Now, it's quite obvious that these forces did not suddenly appear to early aviators. The greatest g's the Wright brothers would have felt was when they crashed their plane into the ground. In order to rack up high g's in the air, the plane needs to have two things. One, a powerful engine capable of reaching a high airspeed, and two, a structurally strong wing capable of resisting the immense bending and shear loads caused by high g's. The first time pilots really began to experience higher g maneuvers was during World War I, as pilots engaged in what the Germans called Kurvenkampf, literally translated to the turning war. In order to fire on an enemy and win an air battle, pilots needed to turn to get a bead on their opponent. If caught by surprise, as often was the case, pilots would need to outturn their opponent to get them off their tail. If a pilot could outturn their opponent, the chances of winning the battle was high. And so, the battle of technological superiority to achieve higher Gs began. Most fighter planes of this era were either triplanes or biplanes primarily because this offered the structural integrity needed to turn with higher Gs. This provides multiple benefits. To understand why, let's first explore the stresses that develop in a wing during level flight. In level flight, the plane needs to generate enough lift to support its own weight. This lift will be distributed along a wing like this. This creates a shear load diagram that will look something like this, and a bending moment diagram that will look something like this with the maximum shear load and maximum bending loads occurring at the root of the wing. And this load is multiplied under high G maneuvers. Let's look at what happens when this plane takes a 60 degree banking turn. As it rolls to a 60 degree bank, its lift rotates with it, but the weight of the plane does not. So we need to generate additional lift in order to support the weight of the plane. This increases our apparent weight. We can break this lift into two components, a vertical component which will need to equal the weight of the plane to maintain its altitude, and a horizontal component which will be the component of lift which will allow the plane to turn. The reaction force to this horizontal component of lift is essentially centrifugal force. The equation for centrifugal force is equal to the mass multiplied by the velocity squared divided by the turning radius of the plane. This is massively simplified but it gives us some interesting insights that will help you understand the dynamics of flight. Let's rearrange this equation to give us just the radius of the turn. If we want to minimize our turning radius, assuming our velocity component is constant, we will need to increase our horizontal component of lift or decrease our mass. We can do this by banking our plane more, which will increase the total lift our plane needs to generate again, increasing our apparent weight even more, or in other words, increasing our Gs. This has two effects. Our drag has gone way up in order to generate this much lift, and the shear and bending forces in our wing have multiplied too, as the wing now has to support the increased apparent weight of the aircraft and generate enough lift to hold it. 
These problems were something early fighter plane designers had to design around. A simple wooden frame would be severely limited in its capacity to hold a load like this. So World War I era engineers needed to get creative with their designs. Splitting the wing in two like a biplane not only shortened the lever arm over which a bending moment could be applied, but it also increased the second moment of inertia of the plane, the same way an I-beam allows a steel girder to hold more weight. Making the wing shorter also helped to reduce the moment of inertia of the plane, like an ice skater pulling their arms into themselves in a turn. In short, splitting the workload between four wings allowed the plane to turn faster. However, it massively increased the drag the wings would generate, and this is where our next problem comes in. Even if their wings could withstand the forces of the turn, their engines were simply too weak to provide the power needed to overcome the increased drag of a turn. Remember when I said to assume the velocity would remain constant? That can't happen unless you increase power. If the plane has no extra power to give, it will gradually lose airspeed and stall. To combat this, these planes would need to either maintain a larger turning radius, which the plane could handle, or do short bursts of higher G turns. So in practice, even if these planes were capable of holding higher Gs, their engines weren't capable of keeping them there long enough to risk the pilot passing out. This changed in World War II as stronger, lightweight aluminium alloys came to the fore and allowed stronger, lighter and more aerodynamic planes. While engine power was on the rise, allowing these planes to maintain higher G turns for longer. However, the first pilots to really experience dangerous high Gs were those performing dives towards the ground, like those of the Stuka dive bomber. This was one of the first planes to be designed with the pilot's experience with high Gs in mind. This plane was developed by Junkers, who were the first aviation manufacturer to use Duralium, the new wonder material composed of aluminium alloyed with copper. They knew how to design a strong plane capable of withstanding the Gs from pulling out from a dive. By diving towards the target and locking it in its sights, it imparted its bomb with the velocity it needed to fly straight to the target with terrifying accuracy, achieving much higher accuracy than a bomber which relied on airspeed and wind calculations to predict the parabolic flight from a high altitude drop. However, this maneuver came with its own problems. The Stuka was capable of a maximum speed of 340 km per hour in level flight, but in a dive it could achieve speeds of up to 600 km per hour. Voluntarily diving at this speed towards the ground in a plane not designed for it was a death sentence. If the plane managed not to tear itself apart in the maneuver, the pilot without a doubt would black out during the pull up. In order to lower the dive speed and thus decrease the Gs during pull up, the Stuka was fitted with dive brakes which reduced the dive speed to 450 km per hour. As soon as the pilot engaged his dive brakes, an automatic safety measure was engaged that would automatically pull the plane out of the dive the moment the bombs were released at the target altitude. This meant that even if the pilot passed out from the 4 to 6 Gs that they experienced, they would recover consciousness to find the plane in level flight. This is basically the same maneuver we made on takeoff in the F-16 but in reverse. I experienced about 4.5 Gs during that vertical climb of about 15,000 feet. It was a mind-blowing experience. Even after being briefed on what to expect and what to do, my subconscious mind was just running through its catalogue of appropriate reflexes and came up with nothing useful. You are not physically capable of breathing under this much load as your diaphragm just can't cope with the pressure. Instead, you are supposed to make this short k sound every few seconds to force your epiglottis to open and allow air to escape while your air mask forces air in. Instead, I just gasped for breath. You are also meant to tense your legs to allow the muscle pressure to force blood out of them. I think I did this, but trying to tense every muscle in your legs while sitting down is a lot harder than you think. That muscle memory just did not exist for me and would require more training. Thankfully, I didn't feel like I lost any vision or came close to passing out, and that may have been because I had a G-suit fitted. These things have air bladders inside them which the plane inflates when it detects Gs. This increases the pressure on your legs and forces blood out and into your brain, and these aren't a new development. They first saw service in World War II 
as planes like the Spitfire came to the fore and were capable of sustaining higher Gs in a normal dogfight. But they saw very limited service with only a few select Seafire pilots ever testing the suit. However, these pilots were forbidden from flying over enemy territory in case the Germans captured and copied the idea. Pilots liked the suit and saw its ability to keep them conscious, but the RAF were not keen on them as they believed it would encourage pilots to regularly exceed the recommended wing loading of the plane and damage it. This changed in the Korean War just five years after the end of World War II. This was the first time jet fighters were dogfighting and wings were getting strong too. Early jet fighters had similar wings to normal piston powered engines, but that started to change during the Korean War with wings shifting towards these delta wing shapes we are now familiar with. Take for example the Grumman F9F Panther, America's first carrier based jet fighter. Its wings are a little different to World War II era planes, but their aspect ratio, the ratio of the wing span to mean width, is still pretty similar to that of a Spitfire at 5.7. The Spitfire had an aspect ratio of 5.6. Now, look at the wings of its older brother, the Grumman F9F Cougar. At 3.97, its aspect ratio has dropped by 30%. The F16 I flew in had an aspect ratio of 3.1. Decreasing the length of the wing and increasing the width of the wing, like this, makes them aerodynamically less efficient, something the power limited engines of World War II would not have wanted. But with jet engines, they could overcome that additional drag, and this triangular shape provided a much stronger wing thanks to the load being spread over a longer wing route and reduced bending load as the lever arm over which the lift acted was shorter. Today, planes like the F-22 Raptor are capable of insane stunts that pilots of the Korean War could only have dreamed of. This is simply the greatest air superiority plane ever made. Vectored thrust gives pilots even more power to shift the direction of the plane without relying on the wings to generate the directional lift needed to take a turn. It has been designed, like all fighter planes, to be unstable to reduce the energy needed to complete a turn, relieving some of the energy and material requirements needed to survive a high G turn. Finally, pilots undergo intensive training to acclimate their bodies to deal with the forces they experience. Centrifuge training became commonplace in the 1970s to allow pilots to test and push their endurance. While rigorous training regimes ensure the pilots have the fitness needed to cope with the fatigue and stress that maneuvers like this put on their bodies. We have come a long way with our technology since World War II, but that doesn't make the achievements and actions of these men any less impressive. The technology may have changed, but the human body and mind has not. We have always learned to work with the tools we had at our disposal to get the upper hand on the enemy, and in the latest episode of my Logistics of D-Day series, now streaming on watchnebula.com, the streaming service I created with my YouTube friends to give us a safe haven from demonetization and false copyright claims. In the latest episode, I explore the deception tactics leading up to D-Day, from the spy networks to the massive fake armies. It's a fascinating side of D-Day operations that is rarely given the attention it deserves. Nebula is now bundled with every Curiosity Stream signup. You can get an entire month of both platforms for free and if you sign up before January 5th, you will get an entire year's membership for just $11.99. That is an incredible price for access to thousands of high quality documentaries. Like this newly released documentary titled The Search for Japan's Lost Super Sub, chronicling the search for the missing I-400 class submarines of the Imperial Japanese Navy. The largest submarines of World War II, which were built as submersible aircraft carriers. An insane technology that the United States captured and studied before destroying all specimens to prevent the Soviets from being able to study them. $11.99 for a full year's access to both CuriosityStream and Nebula is an insane bargain. It could even be a fantastic cheap Christmas present for your documentary loving family member or friend. As always, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, subreddit and Discord server are below.